So this is a talk on uh, diagnosing uh, breathlessness. So I've listed here what are the, uh, the main pathologies responsible for, uh, sort of the main organs that would be responsible for causing breathlessness. So it could be a problem with the lungs, a problem with the heart, a vascular problem, a chest wall problem, a problem with the blood, or a neuromuscular pro problem. Um, the most obvious sort of blood problem, of course, is severe anemia. Neuromuscular, any kind of muscular dystrophy, which probably not that commonly seen, but certainly you see a lot of patients in some clinics. Any sort of chest wall abnormalities like scoliosis, kyphoscoliosis, can actually cause restriction of the lung movements um, and can actually lead to breathlessness. And vascular heart and lungs I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a moment. I think this is actually quite a useful way of classifying and having a format in which to actually think about uh, the diagnosis. So these are some of the common causes of uh, pathologies in the lungs that would lead to uh, breathlessness. So you've got aspiration, infection, asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a pleural effusion, bleeding within the lung tissue itself, a pneumothorax or collapse of the lung, and of course, obstruction of the airways, either by a foreign body or by a tumour. Oh, that's in the vascular bit, yeah, but you're quite right. <laughs> and then for the heart, myocardial infarction. Uh, again, infective processes, endocarditis, you know, for example, can present with breathlessness. Other forms of valve disease, again, aortic or mitral valve disease commonly. Any kind of arrhythmia can cause breathlessness. Cardiac tamponade uh, will cause breathlessness. And of course, left ventricular failure. So these are all the sort of big headings that I would remember. Chest wall deformities I've already mentioned. In addition to anemia in the blood, any form of acidosis can actually lead to a, a compensatory uh, breathlessness type response. I've mentioned the neuromuscular problems and the vascular problems, uh, probably embolism, or a thoracic aortic dissection can also present with breathlessness. So what are the key things to note in the clinical history? Well, again, uh, the questions are usually very simple. How long have you been breathless for? How did the breathlessness begin? Was it sudden or did it come on very gradually? Are there any obvious provoking or exacerbating factors? And I always try to gauge, particularly with the heart failure patients, which are the ones I see commonly, what the severity of the breathlessness is. And this sometimes can be very, very difficult to gauge with a lot of patients. So my standard set of questions for somebody in heart failure is, how much can you walk on the flat, on the level, before you start to get breathless? And if it's less than 100 yards, that's severe heart failure symptoms. I then always ask them, have you tried walking up inclines or up hills? A lot of patients haven't. But another very useful question is to ask them if they've got any stairs at home, and if they can manage the stairs at home. Generally, if you find something within their day-to-day -day activities, uh, you're much more likely to get at least semi-objective information about the severity of their breathlessness. Um, I also ask about nocturnal breathlessness symptoms in heart failure patients as well. Again, is there any relevant past medical history? So if someone's had previous myocardial infarction, revascularization, someone's got diabetes or hypertension or valve disease, these are all potential underlying pathologies that would point you in the direction of perhaps a heart failure or myocardial ischemia. And again, is there any relevant family or social histories? If nothing sort of comes you know, immediately obvious from those first set of preliminary questions, it's always useful to go through and do a quick systems review to try and explore the potential pathologies that we've already mentioned a moment ago. So always ask about chest pain, is it angina, does it sound like pleuritic pain, is it pericarditic pain? Nocturnal breathlessness, so symptoms of orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and peripheral edema. These are very, very typical of breathlessness due to heart failure. Although, some patients with asthma also complain of orthopnea. And very rarely, people that have actually got paralysis of the diaphragms uh, can also complain of orthopnea. So that is exceedingly rare. Generally, though, uh, my way of, again, it's the way in which you ask the question that gives you the answer. So generally, most people, if you ask them how many pillows they sleep on and what size pillows they are, gives you a rough idea of whether they've really got orthopnea or not. 
Most people, if you ask them if they wake up in the night fighting for breath, will know exactly what you mean. And obviously, ankle swelling is pretty obvious. Is there any history of calf pain or swelling to suggest deep venous thrombosis, which might then indicate a possible pulmonary embolism? Have they had any recent fevers or rigels that would indicate an infective process? And going along with that, do they cough? Do they produce any sputum? Is there any bleeding history, gastrointestinal, gynecological, urinary, which might indicate underlying anemia? Have they got any weight loss or night sweats, which might be more in keeping with a malignant process? So hopefully with that combination of questions, you'll start to narrow things down. What I've done here is I've just gone through some of those pathologies quickly to just identify key historical features and examination findings. So for a pneumothorax, patients can present with sudden onset of sharp chest pain. They may or may not have a history of trauma. If you've got very tall, thin patients, they may get a spontaneous pneumothorax. They're obviously going to be breathless, and tachypnea is defined as more than 30 breaths per minute, usually. The breath sounds will be quiet on the affected side when you auscultate. There's increased resonance of percussion, and of course, a chest x-ray will confirm the diagnosis. Again, acute onset within minutes, pulmonary embolism, very similar onset of the pain with tachypnea, but they also will become tachycardic as well. Sorts of risk factors, underlying malignancy, long period of immobilization, pregnancy, use of contraceptives, family history or deep venous thrombosis. And again, investigations of choice would probably be a CT pulmonary angiogram or a, uh, a ventilation perfusion scan. For patients with asthma or COPD, they will complain of wheezing. Again, quiet breath sounds. They may be specific precipitants, particularly in asthmatic patients. They may have a prior history of wheezing or airways uh, airways problems, and again, a chest x-ray and lung function testing will probably help you confirm the diagnosis. For cardiac, the sorts of things to think about, of course, are myocardial infarction. Patients may have classical angi angina with it, but they don't always. A lot of people do have silent myocardial infarctions. And again, the investigations of choice would be a 12-lead ECG and obviously to do some cardiac enzymes to give you the diagnosis. If someone's got heart failure, they will present with the usual nocturnal breathlessness symptoms, but on examination, they will have an elevated jugular venous pressure. On auscultation, you'll get a third heart sound and a very characteristic gallop rhythm. There'll be crackles in the lungs, and of course, the investigations that I would do at the beginning would be a chest x-ray and an echocardiogram there, and then decide where to proceed. A subacute onset of breathlessness would be from hours to days, and in the lungs, pneumonia would fit into that category. So people would probably have fever, cough, chest pain, signs of consolidation uh, uh, on auscultation. The chest x-ray uh, would probably confirm the diagnosis for you if it's done at the right time. And again, blood and sputum cultures, particularly blood cultures, are usually very useful to identify the organism and treat them as appropriate. For cardiac, angina, well, some people will present with typical chest pain, but again, not always. Um, Obviously, explore whether they've got the classical risk factors for coronary disease or not. And again, I would do a 12-lead ECG on these patients, an echocardiogram, and then go on to do some form of stress testing. It could be an exercise test. It could be some form of perfusion uh, scanning uh, if, they're not, if they're unable to do the treadmill test. And then they may or may not require further investigation with coronary angiography. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you.